All right, it's Movember day 23. I've had a bit of a break from videos and um, <clears throat> uh, tonight I'd like to just talk about something that I had a conversation with someone earlier today about. And um, when we get into conflict in relationships and we're in, um, say, recovery, so we've got nowhere now to run to our primary addictions, might have stopped drinking, might have stopped drugging, and now we're down to that sort of raw primary symptoms of codependency. And, um, and when I'm talking about codependency, I'm talking about just that developmental trauma disorder that seems to show up in, it, in the symptoms of um, inappropriate levels of self-esteem, difficulty setting appropriate adult boundaries, or personal boundaries, um, an inability to identify and own our own reality, and then um, move to identify its needs and wants and share it with moderation and allow you to do the same with me with some level of dis differentiation. You'll know you can't do that if you experience relationships as either one up or one down, you're better than or less than, that you're either um, feeling too vulnerable around others or invulnerable, that that, that leads to a resentment and rage issues to either self and, and others, inner critic, outer critic stuff, that we end up in, a, in, in experiencing ourselves in some sort of crisis and for, um, for want of a better word, an existential or spiritual crisis, and that leads us to being dishonest to others. So if you find yourself regularly sort of lying to others about what's really going on. And um, if you've got the evidence in your life of addiction issues, um, mental health conditions, all forms of addiction, or physical uh, illnesses that are hard to treat by modern medicine, or as the A study points out, physical illness. And, um, and we'll have issues with intensity and intimacy. So largely if we can't identify the symptoms, of the, the, the primary symptoms will certainly see the consequences. So anyway, in a relationship, the other day in our Breaking Free group, we talked about um, if we can't establish this, this sense of self, then we'll never get to the oneness. And Pia talks about that, Pia Melody talks about that in Breaking Free in her step two. She's, she gets people to really get curious and inquire about how were we traumatized parentally? Were we abandoned? Were we criticized? Were we offended, abused? Um, or neglected, and, and, and how does that um, just taint our view of a power greater than ourselves? Well, this is more about the fact that I just don't even get a sense of that, not at a somatic level, not at an existential level, not at a cognitive or emotional level about this sort of sense of oneness, because I'm largely either enmeshed or separated from others. So when you're in a relationship, what are a couple of tips to just let you know it's going off the rails? Because when you're first trying to deal with this, this thing sneaks up on you and before you know it, you're in the symptoms. And so Pia Melody in her book, Facing Love Addiction, had some great tips. And, and I've just drawn her reality model behind me to, to refer to it. So I'm probably going to bounce around between a couple of things. But the main thing I really wanted to read is guidelines to being in a relationship here. If you're in recovery, these can, these can be really helpful. It was rocket science to me to find out these couple of things, and particularly the, the, these, the top three in this chapter. So I'll read those out. She says, here are some guidelines that Pat and her had developed uh, for their own relationship and we find helpful, especially when we're discussing, or, uh, discussing something or sharing our intellectual and emotional reality with each other. So number one, don't assign blame when you're in conflict. When you're in conflict in your partner with your partner about something, don't make your partner wrong. Just make statements about what happened and what what feelings you're having about it. I find that this takes a lot of discipline. Make sure that the statement about what you perceived happening does not include any hidden or open message about the other person being less than. For example, it implies the person is less than to say when you were acting like a nincompoop in the garage. A more appropriate statement might be yesterday when you walked into the garage and raised your voice to a high volume and said. So describe what happened without labeling and um, and labeling the person as a neek and poop. So the, the idea about blame, I grew up in the family of blame. Uh, my, one of my mother's mottos was, why, why should anyone feel good if she felt bad? So if she felt bad, she would make it, everyone else uh, accountable to it. And it's been an awful thing to grow up with. So when it comes to blame, then the... The next two things help you work out, well, how do I blame somebody? What's that sort of dysfunction of blame? But just to know, if you catch yourself blaming, it's a red flag. I'm out of my integrity. I'm over in their backyard and I'm assigning them, uh, assigning who they are. So the second one is don't keep score on your partner. 
When your partner is confronting you about your behavior, avoid bringing up how the partner did the same thing several times last week. What your partner did last week is not relevant to your conversation this week. The two of you are discussing what you've done this week. Now, I know with, uh, with things in relationships where there needs to be um, big ticket boundaries, if you're uh, suffering from betrayal trauma and someone had an affair last week and they've had another one this week, that's not what P is talking about here. She's, she's, my understanding is in just general communication, we're trying to have some sort of sovereignty to this conversation, what's happening now. And once we bring in that, that um, other evidence, it doesn't seem to go well. If we can just stick to the conversation, the thing that we're bringing up, the, the, the event that's happened for us, and then to just stay with our reality around that and not have to keep score on how many other times they've done it. It just seems to allow our message to get across. The other one I really like is don't argue perceptions or facts. Now, Dan Siegel, the psychiatrist, says there's no such thing as immaculate perception. So this was Pia's take on this many years ago. Understand that each partner has perceptions and that your job is to identify your own perception and listen to your partner's perception. We can probably be most respectful of our partner simply by hearing who that person is without judgment or trying to make your partner or our partner change his or her reality. For example, let's say that your best friend Elizabeth, uh, let me just say that again. For example, let's say that you and your best friend Elizabeth are looking at a turtle. You say, what a nice color green. And Elizabeth responds, no, it's more of a blue than green. Once you're aware that the turtle looks blue to Elizabeth, don't try to argue her into saying that it's green. Letting Elizabeth have her own reality makes her feel your love. You keep your perception of the green turtle and let it go. At first, this may like feel like dishonesty, but as I began to do this, I was amazed at how many times I later saw the blueness or realized that there are, there are different ways of perceiving in almost any situation. This has made me feel much more comfortable with people who see things differently from the way that I see them. Those three, not arguing facts, not sort of trying to assign blame and keep score has, has meant that to do that, you, you are really challenged to practice those skills. So why I wanted to draw this up, it's that Pia just made that point that we can have an event outside of us. And what she's talking about is my perception is different because when I take that in through the five senses, through, through my entire history, especially developmental history, my core beliefs and experiences, I assign a meaning to it. That meaning is unique to me. But as humans, we have lots of common humanity experiences. So we can pretty safely trust that we all know what a whale is or that we all um, know what flying is. But you might love flying and every time you're on a plane think it's fantastic, but the person you're sitting next to might absolutely hate flying, get really nervous and could be medicated. So what it can be dangerous to do in a relationship is to assume someone's going to see it our way or try and manipulate them into seeing it our way. To make that possible, we have to have external and internal boundaries where we can identify what's true, not true or questionable, because that allows us to create a gap between me and the other person. And that's that if I can't find my separate self, I'll never get a sense of oneness. And so, so I, I need to have this differentiation so I can experience me experiencing you and then be in relationship with me so I can be in relationship with you. See, I came from an enmeshed household where that person's thoughts determine what I thought, that person's feelings determine what I felt, and that person's behavior determined what I felt. And I had to learn to hide it. And that's where I learned to adapt. Now, there's different words we use today for that, but I'm staying with Peter's words for now. The other thing I thought it's worth putting up here that makes this difficult is that we can have a, an, ex, an emotional experience that's adult or right-sized around those core primary feelings. But also, if you're traumatized as a person, you're going to have toxic levels of feelings around this. A, a rage instead of anger, um, depression instead of pain, panic instead of fear. So not, noting that what feeling state I'm in will determine how much self-care I've got to do just to be in relationship with you. And if I'm not conscious of that, if I'm feeling especially pained or especially panicked or especially aggravated, then if I'm in that habit of blaming you and have no boundary, then I'm going to make another mess that's got to be cleaned up. The other thing that's interesting, if we're low in energy or in a regressed sort of state and our boundaries are damaged, it might be that I'm carrying the energy of the other person and it's not mine. One of the things that Pia 
highlights to help you work out if that's true or not is, well, if I'm having a lot of emotion, but I'm really confused about what's going on, it might mean that I actually haven't got stuff up here, that it's actually the, the feeling reality is someone else that's being disowned. Now, it's a tricky one for codependents because we're always looking to blame people anyway, but it's still worthy of a mention right now. Now, why I mention these things, carried feelings, toxic feelings, and especially around our, if we've got trauma history and, and core beliefs that have a lot of cognitive distortions due to that history, then that means to even just do this and to create the ability to um, not argue my reality versus yours, not argue fa those facts, not assign blame for what's happening inside of me and to not, um, to, to not keep score means that I will have to reparent myself to make this happen because we are quite powerless over this being triggered. But what we're not powerless over is how we can soothe and nurture this wounded self that will be largely felt in our somatic body, uh, have lots of cognitive negative distortions and have lots of toxic level of feeling or numbness and can largely get down to some quite distorted behavior. So nurturing that part of us that's going to soothe that and then with that part of us that learnt to adapt, it, it, it's not killing that part of us off. That got us here. Those adaptions saved us. But we don't have to keep taking that bazooka to a Monopoly game anymore. Or we don't have to bunker down to avoid um, an interpersonal conflict that's not dangerous to us. It's just challenging. So this idea that, um, that to, to, not, to, to, to not blame someone else for our reality means I need to know my reality and sometimes in just knowing the examine life's no picnic I need to you know practice those skills of valuing myself setting boundaries identifying my reality and moving to get needs met at the same time as nurturing and taking care of those those sort of injured post-traumatic parts of me and that's that's for other tips and other videos so the three things to take home if you find yourself assigning blame uh, keeping score and, and um and uh and what was the third one i don't want to redo this video because i'm being human right now so the the arguing facts assigning blame and keeping score there you go i made it there's some other tips in here that she goes on to mention that that, that can certainly be part of um uh being in a healthy relationship but uh, i will keep this video to a manageable size um but but it's worth a, a read if anything that i've said here um uh, if you find anything I've said here helpful, please look up this book. She does go on to talk about um, uh, don't threaten abandonment in the face of conflict and communicate in sort of four sentences or less. In other words, keep it brief and to the point. Um, and she certainly makes the point to not worry if your partner's going to use this model because you'll improve and you'll grow and you'll change. And in relationships, we're certainly 100% in charge of our 50. So that, that sort of philosophy is what, you know, when I'm on song and I'm doing well, I take into it. So yeah, Facing Love Addiction um, is where this resource has come from, PM Melody. Um, I hope this has been useful. It's Movember Day 23. I'm going to try and keep the videos rolling from here on in. Um, so remember, be gentle with your heart. And uh, I look forward to seeing donations and support coming in on the Movember page. So take care and I'll see you again tomorrow.